Hey, before we get into uh, this in a more serious vein, a few few things I wanted to mention. One is I really appreciate you folks coming each week, though it's been a very small group. I would not want you to think you're unimportant. Uh, the uh, the video YouTube videos have had about ninety thousand hits. The ones we did seven years ago. So there's a bigger audience than than here in this room. And uh, judging by the early comments and returns, the new series of videos is, is even more getting hit real quick with a lot of numbers. So that's really good because it's exposing a lot of people uh, all over the world to, this, to the wonders of this game. So thanks for coming. And I did plan on having pizzas here, but when I went in to order them, the gal said, I don't think we have any. I said, can you be sure? <laughs> and she said, yeah, I'll take a look. So I said, even if you got one, that's OK. I'd like to have three if you have them. She came back and said, there's zero. So I hope you all ate a dinner. <laughs> I did, so I'm not. I'm not hungry. I won't miss the pizza. But if you, if you were planning on pizza tonight, I'm sorry, I won't be able to take time out to bake them. Uh, I want to. I want to start with a few stories tonight. A couple little stories that relate to my mother. So, I think we're ready to go. All right. Uh, some folks ask me how I learned this game. Learned? I'm still learning. My mother never taught me a damn thing. Oh, excuse me, Mom. My mother was looking for somebody who she could lick. She didn't have any of this modern parenting skill that somehow I got to nurture my child and allow them to be successful, that I've got to give them some ribbons for their success as they pass through life. Otherwise, they won't amount to anything. Her idea was you're more likely to amount to something if I keep my damn thumb on you and kick your butt every damn chance I get. So my mother just accidentally had me playing cribbage starting at age four. And the reason was my dad left home like 4.30 or 5 in the morning. And I mean, I just could stand nose high to the table at that time, 1941. And one morning after he left, he said, why don't you get your butt up here at this table and we'll try this game? Well, I don't ever remember her teaching me anything. Never did. And I thought, well, it's OK. It's OK. And so I learned very quickly. And so by the time I was five, she, some morning she was wishing I didn't show up. <laughs> and of course, it was all luck. Lucky damn brat. My mother, was, my mother was a Marine Corps drill sergeant. In fact, when I joined the Marine Corps in 1958, and these drill sergeants thought they were tough. I said, thanks, mother, because there was not one of them as tough as my mom. Not one of them. And my mother would say to me when I came home from school, ah, were you a good boy in school today? I'd say yes. She said, that's a damn lie. You've never been good for 10 minutes in your life. <laughs> Whatever was handy, I get a few spats. And she was probably right. I probably wasn't good for 10 minutes in my life. Well, in the sixth grade, I stole a girl's candy bar and ate it. Ooh, two bad things. I couldn't return it, could I? I mean, once you eat it, what if? <laughs> and, but I was taught to be honest. Ooh, that cost me big time, too. So I go in the principal's office. The principal in those days was a guy about that broad. And it seemed like he had to duck to let the moon pass by. About six foot five and about that broad. 
and he had a paddle about that long. And so he called me in because somebody said that they thought I took the girl's candy bar. And he said, did you take the girl's candy bar? I said, yeah. He said, what did you do with it? I said, I ate it. <laughs> had me bend over that desk. Every time he hit me, I thought I bounced off the wall. Five times. Oh, ah! Jiminy! Five times! So now, my butt's sore, and it comes time to go home, and I know the first question my mother's going to have is, were you a good boy in school today? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, well, I could lie. I'm riding a school bus, see? We had a half mile walk from the school bus to the house, so I got to think about it for quite a while before I got to the house. But I had it right. The first question was, were you a good boy today? No, I wasn't, mother. What did you do? I said, I stole a girl's candy bar and ate it. She said, no damn kid of mine is going to grow up to be a thief. Ah, 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 ah. Well, anyway, my dear mother lived to be almost 95. And when I founded this cribbage club, the Hale Centralia Cribbage Club, as part of the American Cribbage Congress, www.cribbage.org, my mother was one of the original members. And we had a, what we called a triple crown. Well, the triple crown was a 29 hand, a 28 hand, and a grand slam. She had them all. I didn't. In fact, she died in 2012, and I was, it took me another four and a half years to get the Triple Crown. <laughs> the 29 was the elusive one. Quite a few folks got the Grand Slam in the 28, but 29 is pretty elusive. Well, sometime in that period, I think she was about 83 years of age, I took her up to a tournament at Tacoma. In fact, it was a, the Tacoma Club has just been founded. Pierce County, 31 for two peggers. And uh, the director of the club was a guy by the name of C.A. Mitchell. Everybody called him Mitch. I was feeling really good. I won eight out of nine, 16 cards. And my mother was like my brother in some respects, kept things pretty close to her chest. And so, I'm thinking, well, eight out, of, eight out of nine, hell, I might be the top card. Turns out my mother was the top card. And Mitch, Mitch calls me up there, and he said, you know, George really had a good card today. I said, one eight out of nine, and a 16, and that's second place. Pretty good money, but it's second. And he said, I want you to know the first place card is a 17, and that's his mother. And he said, you know, it's pretty obvious. She taught him all he knows about cribbage, but she didn't teach him all she knows about cribbage. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was, I don't know if you needed all that, but uh, anyway. <laughs> It's great to be here, and we're going to be talking about positional cribbage, playing positional cribbage. Uh, I give you material on Delin Colbert's theory of 26 last week, and we pretty much went over that. Well, there's a number of voices that have said the same thing in different ways, and this is from John Chambers' book, which is called a I think they've got a paper call with a number up in the corner, 8-1. Cribbage, a new concept. This is what Chambers has to say about position, very much the same as what Colbert says, only maybe in a little different language. And that is, play, your, play position first, the odd second. Sometimes you look at the board, position will be a very clear indicator of whether you need to choose a defense or an offense, or as Channing says, neutral, uh, optimal strategy. Play the odd second. D 
Dealer is at hole 100. Cone is at 104. Would you pair the opening lead? No. Too big a risk. The person at 104 with six puts them at 110. So, so no, it's position tells you you should play very defensive. If this person gets out from 104, you want them to get out because they got a 17 hand. You don't want to give them four or five pegs and then have them win the game. If you have position protected, same thing. If you have position protected. If you can't win or get into position, take risk. It's a difficult way to play cribbage, but you can't play the game timidly if you're 15 or 20 points behind. You, you'll still throw some of those games away, but some of them you'll pull out. So if you're not in good position, go for it. The earlier in the game, the better. It's a lot easier to go for it on 2nd Street than it is on 4th Street. And of course, the dealer has a big advantage. And the dealer should play defensively and the non-dealer offensively. And you see the same dealer is on par with 17 at the end of hand two. And like the boards indicate, the dealer has 50% chance par if they only have seven at the end of hand one. If you look on the back of 8-4, I got another little story to tell you here. You'll see a paper that says keep the points or don't keep the points. This is actually a thousand games. When I first came into the American Cribbage Congress, many people, including some of the highest ranked players, so don't worry about it, just keep the points. Well, that's an easy answer, isn't it? Think what we've been through here in this series of classes. We've been through <laughs> hand recognition and counting, discarding to own crib, discarding to pwn crib, basic pegging, advanced pegging, pegging traps, percentage plays, theory of 26, now we're going to get into critical position zone. We've been through all of the. How do you tell somebody who's just coming to play cribbage that they need to know all that stuff? What most people do is say, just keep your points. That's, that's the easy thing to do. Well, it didn't seem to me to be right because I noticed some of these star players, they wouldn't keep their points. And so I thought, well, I wonder how bad the results will be. So for 1,000 games, I kept the points. Didn't make any difference where I was on the board. If I had 12, I kept them. If I had eight, I kept them. If I had six, I kept them. If I was coming first and needed three and had three fives and a king, I kept 14. That's better than three, ain't it? So, so I kept the points all the way in these 1,000 games. And you can see the results of them here. There are 100 at a time there. And you see what my average, my average win was by 13 points. My average loss was by 16 points. Skunk wins was 56. Now remember, this is where I'm keeping all the points. Skunk wins were 56, and my skunk losses were 63. Keeping the points. On the first deal, I won 268 on those games where I had the opening deal, and I won 231. Well, you can see right now that that's 464 in the first column there after the 100 games entered. And the first column shows the number one is 464. 
So out of a thousand, keeping the points, I won 464 games. Eh. Wow, this crap's no good at all. I ain't even hitting 50%. So then I did a thousand games where I didn't keep the points. I discard, I sometimes gave up points to put a couple in my crib. <coughs> I played low discard averages to my opponent's crib, even sometimes if it meant giving up a point in my hand. For instance, I might have a two, six, seven, eight with a nine and a king. And rather than keep the six, seven, eight, I'd throw the king in the nine and play the deuce six, seven, eight. So I didn't keep the points, did I? And if those things you see make a terrific difference. You'll notice I won 579 out of this next thousand games. That's right on target, 57.9%. And you notice what happened to my winning percentage? My, the margin I won by, it went up by almost three points. And my losing margin came down by a couple points. And instead of 56 skunk wins, I had 91. Now, <laughs> see, so it really shows the contrast very clearly. And that's, that's what caused me to develop what's called critical position zones, which we're going to get to, was this understanding that playing position, choosing a strategy, offense, defense, neutral, optimal, whatever you want to call it, high, low, <laughs> and reverse, <laughs> something, that's, that's critical to cribbing. But the problem is you can't teach it in five minutes when somebody walks up to you and says, what can you do? So you very likely might say to a new player coming into your club, just keep the points. But at some point, they need, to, they need to understand that keeping the points is really a very mediocre way to play the game. If you want to move above mediocrity, then you've got to develop these nuances which are so important to success in cribbing. Very complex game. I'm going to get a chance to see some other stuff. It took me a long time to accumulate. But it's important to see this because 8.2. At the top of that first page, it should say self profile. Now, this may look like a bunch of gobbledygook to you, but these are all actual games. And what I wanted to do here. I didn't believe that the theory of 26 worked for me. And I didn't believe it worked for anybody else. So I tracked these games, thousands of them. This is one sheet of 40 games. And I've circled in, in black the number of times I did not make the theory the 26. <coughs> Out of 40 games, I did not make 26, 22 times. But if you look at the bottom of that line, that column with all those black circles on it, you see what's at the bottom down there? It's almost 26, isn't it? 25.35. Well, you know what happens. We get these barn burner games. In fact, if you go down there a few games, you'll see a 31.75. You see some big numbers? What happens is we get these big games. And so, yeah, they're, they're in fact way beyond 26. So when you add it all up, at the bottom of the sheet, you get a 26. But when you look at the individual games, there's 22 out of 40. That's almost 60%. Almost 60%, if it was 24, it would be 60% where I'm not achieving the 26. Now, on the back is how my opponents do. I thought, well, I'm a pretty good pegger. 
I'm pretty good at this game. I think my opponent probably even do worse than me. And so lo and behold, on the back of it is my opponent's profile. You see what's at the bottom of their column? With all the black circles in it? The bottom? 24. And they didn't make the theory of 26, the reality of 26 in 29 out of 40 games. So over 70% of the games, the theory of 26 was not realized. And this again is a block of 40 games. So if you're comparing it, the same as on the other side, except this side is my opponent, and this, this is me. But so, that caused me to start doing some thinking. If I'm not doing it, and if my opponent's not doing it, who is? Might not be anybody. But, but it's a great, I gotta give the Lynn Culver credit because he revolutionized thinking in cribbage. The idea that position and this idea of 10 and 16, 26 holes, uh, you'll notice when we get to critical position zone that the starting hole in each of those zones is the par hole that DeLynn Culver established. So in no way do, am I speaking here in a way to cause doubt about the work he did. It's the best piece of work that was done in the history of cribbage. And this is just a way Perhaps the theory of 26 is a reality of 24 or 25. And that's what we want to focus on, the reality, not the theory. The theory is behind where we're headed. But you see the pattern here? Both sides, opponent and me, we don't make it. We don't make it. And the deck of cards is what it is. And so I, uh, this, this work was done about ooh, maybe 1996. I don't know if it has a date on it. Some of them do. Anyway, it was done a long while ago, 20 years. And I don't think it would be any different today, even though my playing has improved. I think the percentage that I wouldn't make 26 would be almost identical to what it is on these, these games we show here. And there's another sheet here, 8.3, that does the same thing, but it's not laid out in the same way. But if you look down, if you look down the right column on that sheet, you see there's a whole lot less, a lot more games under 26 than there are over 26. And the average of that column is 24.4. That's 50 games covered there. And I don't know, somehow the back part got cut off, but there's 22 games on the back part. And again, there's more games that don't make 26, but the bottom line on the back portion is 26. So, so if you look at your cribbage boards tonight, you'll see there's a, there are little zones. They make it a little more difficult to play on the board, <laughs> uh, moving your pegs. But you'll notice there's little zones there. Now on, on street one, so what we've done, instead of trying to remember all these par holes for the dealer and the par holes for the non-dealer, you start on street one and you create a zone from hole 17 to 21. So if you look at your cribbage board, you'll see that holes 17 to 21 are circles. That first hole in that zone is the par hole for deal two for the dealer 
or deal one for the non-dealer, if you want to try to follow that. But the idea is you go around the board. So you want to be the first person to deal. Yes, yeah, is to beat the dealer. Beat the dealer at his own game. This little zone is created for dealing, where you need to be when you deal. So if you're the non-dealer of hand one, and you get dealt a 12-point hand, you don't want to sit back and smile and act comfy. You want to go for another four or five pegs if you can swing it. Play the hand in a way that you think it will peg, because you could overtake the dealer's advantage on the first hand, and that can be huge be huge. So, so we want you to try to get as deep as you can in these zones. Very difficult to take over on first street. But many times by the time you get to third street you can if you're, if you're playing to do that. So on first street it's 17 to 21. On second street, now the streets are exactly these 30 whole segments. First street being 1 through 30 and 2nd Street being 31 through 60, and 3rd Street being 60 through 89, and 4th Street being 90 through 121, 120. All of them are 30, 30, 30 holes. So the 2nd Street zone, 43 to 47. That's where you need to be when you're dealing. Now, all position is relative. You can end up in very low scoring hands on both sides of the board. And so the, the deal it is, is not that important. Where is your opponent in relation to you? You might be well short. You might be dealing from 32. And the zone there is 43. But your opponent is at 26. How many do they need to deal? 17. They need 17 to get from 26 to 43. So you, you've got an advantage, even though neither one of you are anywhere near where you're supposed to be. Position's relative, relative. Look where the pegs are. If you have an advantage, play accordingly. Third Street, 61 to 90. And the, the zone, CPZ. CPZ is short for critical position zone. 69 to 73, and then 4th Street, 91 to 120, is 95 to 99. Now there's a huge difference. If you're dealing from 95, you've got about a 55% chance to win. If you're dealing from 98, you've got about a 70% chance to win. So very important to try, as you move around that board, to get into these zones deeply. The sooner you start doing that, the better. So that when you get down on 4th Street, you're not looking, hey, what was happening for me when I was keeping the points? I was dealing the all on when I got on 4th Street, I was sitting at 91, 92, 93. Those are not good places to be, even though they seem close. Very often they predict the outcome of the game. It's very difficult to make up ground when you're on 4th Street. So make it up earlier and try to end up in that 95 to 99 zone deeply. Very hard to head you off if you're at 98 dealing. Unless your opponent is at 117. <laughs> so again, it's relative. But as a rule, if you're dealing from 98, and your opponent is anywhere near you on the board, you're going to be really hard to beat. And there's kind of how that sorts out. Now this is this might be, I would have probably not have put this one down at 90. I just probably repeated the 80 because I think it never gets to the point where it's that high. But I was trying to make these even. And there, actually what should be there is about, instead of 10 points difference each time, ought to be about seven, okay? And so this number wouldn't be 90. If you can make that kind of a mental change if you have this in your, in your notes. Yeah, 
Now you've got a paper uh, with numbered up in the corner 8.5, which has all this information in it. And down uh, in the fourth paragraph, it says, get deep in the zone, and nowhere can the effect of that be demonstrated more clearly than in that fourth street critical position zone holds 95 to 99. And then it goes on to say, slightly more than 50 from hole 96, odds of winning approach 60. That, make that a 57. I'll make the changes in this another time. And the next one, instead of 70, make it 64. And the next one makes 71. And the last one will be just about 80. So these are all just a little off. I'm sorry about that. But, but there's a, there is a bit great difference between dealing from 95 or 99. And that's the point I want to make. I did this quickly, and I've studied it a little more since, and it's about seven points difference on each of these. By the way, you, I'm glad that you're all here. Uh, and you don't have to be a student of this game necessarily if you're a natural card player. There are some folks who just do this very naturally and do it very well. My brother, Gary, happens to be one of them. He's never studied the game like I do. I have no feeling for this game or any other game. I have no natural understanding of any card game, but I'm a good card player. Whether I played hearts, pinochle, uh, cribbage is my favorite. Uh, I study it. I study it. That's all I do. I play the numbers. And that works for me. What it says to me, though, is if you don't have this natural feel for cards, is there is a way to improve. And that's through study. And if you study it, and you study it, and you study it, it should open new little windows of learning. It should never reach the point where you really think, I got it all figured out. It's, each, each little bit of knowledge opens into a wider horizon. And that's real important. Real important. I had an email today <laughs> complimenting me on the new set of videos. And what I told that student in the state of Maine was that, you know, it's not what I have to say. It's not the experience of I've had. It's not the manner in which it's delivered. It's the degree to which the student absorbs the information and applies it to their play. There's no, there's no value in, in any other sense. So it's the student that determines the value of the material not the presenter. I'm just a vehicle for putting it out there. So, but if there's some parts of it, there's so much to the game. Settle on the parts where you think you need the most improvement. Tackle them one at a time. And you, you, you'll make improvement that way, and then once you have one section underway, organized, and clear in your mind how to approach it, move to the next one. And I think you'll find it's not overwhelming then. If you try to do all of it at once, it's too much. Let's take a break and be back in about 10. Thank you. How scary do you like?